Well, there was a situation, the situation in Canada, the United States was a little bit different. In Canada, um, because we've always been a more controlled society, the uh, medical training was controlled as well. And so virtually all medical training was done through universities. Whereas in the United States, always a much more wide open society, there were three ways of becoming a physician. <coughs> One was through just apprenticing with a local physician. You apprentice for a while, you become a physician, like becoming a, a handyman. Or you can go through some privately owned medical school where you are taught by the person who owns the school, and tested by the person who owns the school, or you can go through the university system. And so in the United States, it was particularly difficult to know if you saw a physician, whether your physician had come through one route or the other, simply by the way that the person presented himself or herself. I suppose you could check their papers, but it was often difficult to know whether a private school had the same level of uh, expertise that a university would have. So the public, however, in the United States, had come to believe that science-based medicine was the best, the, the, the larger part of the public. Yet, because of all these other ideas that were starting to be developed, chiropractic, osteopathy, homeopathy, and so forth, physicians themselves became concerned. Because the public didn't seem to have a good basis for deciding whether homeopathy is as good as, as evidence-based medicine or whatever. And so, the Carnegie Foundation in the United States, responding to this concern, set up uh, 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 an evaluation. And they commissioned this man, not a physician, Abraham Flexner, to look at medical education in the United States and Canada. Canada was specifically included, and to make recommendations. And so what he did, uh, he surveyed all these different schools, all these different forms of medicine, published his report in 1910, Medical Education in the United States and Canada, and recommended the German model of medical training, focusing both on scientific research and clinical training, and as a result of his report, uh, as well, I've said here, considered a, a milestone in Canadian and, and United States medical education, but uh, and as a result, high standards were, were set, uniform standards were set, and 80% of the medical schools in the United States, remember, most, most in, in Canada, everything was at the university level, wow. in the United States, that wasn't the case, 80% of them were closed down. So, Medicine really took a, a, a strong, strong step towards being evidence-based, towards science. And uh, in fact, as a result, medical science has excelled in curing all sorts of We take for granted the successes of medical science. We get upset because why can't they cure cancer? But think about, it. when I was a kid, I knew people with polio. And then one day, one day, there's a Announced on the radio, no more polio. You drink this little gut and gloop and you won't get polio. There's this amazing thing. What about smallpox? What about all these things? The scourges of mankind, womankind, humankind, gone because of medical science. So we can go through a long list of diseases, lots yet to be uh, dealt with, of course. So the question is, what happened? You know, we, we had this, this tremendous uh, success with medical practice and medical science. And even up until the 50s, although alternative therapies had some appeal to people, it was nothing like today. And here we are today where people, most people, I shouldn't say most people, but many people can't tell the difference between an alternative non-scientific therapist and someone trained in medical science. Ask someone on the street, is a doctor of nat naturopathy it's the same as a doctor of medicine? I've talked to many people who think chiropractic is a branch of medicine, homeopathy is a branch of medicine. I'll get into that a bit more later. So why are we going back to these preflexor ideas and again, as I said at the beginning, it's wrong to assume this is simply because people are stupid, people are, are not logical. I'm a psychologist, I always look in terms of needs. Do you want to understand someone's behavior, I would argue? Find out what the behavior does in terms of the needs it serves. Because in medicine, if modern medicine serves all the needs that people have, there won't be any competition from alternative 
practitioners. So there's something going on that alternative practitioners are satisfying in terms of needs that traditional science-based medicine is not. So it's also important, and this, I can't stress this point too strongly, I don't have to stress it at all, it's so logical. No one chooses to be fooled or deceived. No one says, hey, I think I'll take a chance with my health and go to an alternative practitioner. What the heck, I'll roll the dice. I know I can get cured over here, but I think I'll just play this game and see what happens. People don't do that. People are very serious about their health. People want to be well. They want their loved ones to be well. And if they're going to alternative practitioners, they're doing it because they believe that this is going to help them. And there's some reason why they're going to these practitioners and not to, to uh, traditional physicians. So, when there is good, clear, undeniable treatment from modern medicine, you don't find competitors. If you break your leg, if anyone breaks their leg, they don't ask for, an os for, for a homeopath or a herbal uh, therapist or a chiropractor. They want a surgeon. They want a hospital. And similarly with accidents. <laughs> You know? No one says, no, keep the medics away from me. Give me some more therapeutic touch. <laughs> so we, we, we should accept that whenever people turn to non-rational, non-scientific approaches, it's because the rational scientific approach in some way isn't responding to the needs. And these needs often are beyond what we consider to be medical needs. And that's the point. This is really well I'll get into more detail. So how is it that conventional medical based therapy is failing? Now see I'm taking a different tack here because it's easy to stand up here and just attack alternative medicine. I do not on the other hand want to give the impression I'm attacking conventional medicine. What I want to say is that conventional medicine does very well at what it does but it doesn't satisfy all the needs that people have. And that's where alternative medicine does so well. So I want to look at some of the factors then that lead people to alternative, now often called complementary medicine. That was a kind of a, uh, uh, a clever thing for alternative practitioners to do, to label themselves as complementary practitioners, because that sounds like, hey, we're in the same ballpark. You know, we, we're, we're doing what physicians do. We're alongside them. We're like paramedics and so forth. Well, one of the concerns that people have is that modern medicine has become somewhat, in some cases, dehumanized, certainly technology dominated. Now, Flexer brought about a lot of reforms in terms of stressing the importance of science in medicine. One of the things he did was, and, and his, these effects, by the way, carried down to the present, he said that doctors should be trained not by other doctors out there in the field, but by working scientists, by professors, by people who are trained as educators. So you don't simply have someone coming in who has a medical practice teaching people how to diagnose something. So you have this research function attached to the professorial role. And this is interesting because just a few years ago, and I've stated the, the year here, 2001, Professor Angus Ray wrote in the Canadian Medical Association Journal that, that there, there, there was a, a byproduct of Flexner's recommendation, I'll just read this to you, by banning the practitioner and relying on salaried researchers to train doxers, Flexner divided the profession and contributed to its decline in the public eye. Many now see physicians as more interested in the science of medicine than in patients themselves, one reason why millions seek satisfaction in alternative care. Attributing such kudos to research and disparaging clinical medicine has brought about a decline in interest in producing well-trained generalists. Well, I'm quoting Professor Ray, who's a, in the faculty of medicine. Um, the other thing that's happened, of course, in recent years is the proliferation of medication. And this has been obviously good if medication helps you but not so good if every visit to your physician simply ends up with a prescription. You know, I look at my field of psychology and compare it with psychiatry. If you go back 
to the 50s, there weren't any good drugs around for mental problems. The psychiatrist did psychotherapy. You would see your psychiatrist for an hour a week. But now most psychiatrists don't have time for that. Most visits to psychiatrists are for medication reviews. 15 minutes, you review your medication, you're out. And this has happened in other areas of medicine as well. Medicine is, uh, pharmaceuticals are effective in many cases, but what they've done is make it possible for physicians to spend less and less time with their patients. And also as a result of these medications, older remedies that used to be quite effective in their own way were ignored. And then so, a uh, man named Lufano wrote a book called The Rise and Fall of Modern Medicine, 1999. And he said that after the anti-inflammatory drugs became available, he, this is his quote, the skills of rheumatologists revolved around juggling various toxic regimes of drugs in the hope that the benefits might outweigh the sometimes grievous side effects. Again, Lefano is a physician. Not saying that these drugs don't work, but the trip to the rheumatologist took on a different flavor, and he pointed out that other things, such as massage, and manipulation, dietary advice, were discarded only to be picked up later by alternative practitioners. So one could argue that in some, I'm not saying across the board, but in some cases, while it was so focused on science and, and research and so on, medicine <coughs> had lost its heart, lost its, its human touch. A again, you know, I have a very good family physician. I had my annual checkup the other day, and I spent eight minutes with him. From top to bottom, I'm healthy. But then a bunch of machine meat came in. The nurse brought in an ECG, and you know the routine. Now, I think he's doing a good job, but there certainly wasn't a lot of time to talk. So in the old days, as you, some of you will remember, family physicians were, they knew your family. They knew a lot about you. They showed interest in you. They had time. Modern physicians don't have that time. And most trips to physicians these days either end up with a prescription or a referral. You get some more tests. You get some blood work done. You see a specialist. Whereas if you see an alternative, uh, an alternative, alternative pardon me, practitioner, these are always generalists. You're not referred to someone else, not very often anyway. <laughs> and they take an interest in you and your problems and your life. And they rarely pass you on to anybody else. Well, a second point I want to make is that there's some dissatisfaction coming from the power imbalance in medicine. Now, this has been there for a long time. It's much worse in Europe, where, where you know, physicians have uh, been uh, uh, rather snooty when it comes to much of the public in general. That's changing, too. But there was a very great deal of status associated with being a physician in Europe, a little bit less so in North America, but nonetheless, it was there. This status imbalance, this power imbalance, has led to some difficulties in communication. You, the situation is you have the high status, all-knowing physician and the, the patient who doesn't know anything. So you go in to see your doctor. This actually happened to me once years ago. I had a sore throat. He said, okay, get on the couch, take down, get on the table, take down your pants. I said, oh, okay. I tried to figure out what this had to do with. I thought, well, probably glands or something like that. Still don't know to this day, but he checked me out and it was fine. All right? So, not a lot of conversation. We would do almost anything, right? A physician says, you know, bend over, you bend over. <laughs> and I, I don't want to get too much of my personal life, but I had four wisdoms who were taken out at the same time by a dentist. He knew I was a psychologist because he asked me what I did. So I presume he thought I could understand big words. Uh, and, and, and he put an a intravenous needle into my arm, as I've seen in the dentist chair, and I said, would you mind telling me what that is? And he said, something to make, make you feel good. I said, well, I don't know what it is. He said, do you want me to do this or not? You know if you want. I said, okay, do it, do it, do it. He wouldn't even tell me what it was. So this, again, this attitude, and I hope you have physicians who don't, don't have this attitude towards you, but it's certainly an attitude that many people complain of. And again, alternative practitioners tend not to be that way. They tend to be um, much more engaging, more time, more, more uh, uh, interest in you. Here's what uh, some, some uh, researchers found in a study of physicians. This is going back to 88. I'm sure it hasn't changed very much. Um, they looked at conversations between physician and patient. 
We found the physician does most of the talking. The physician initiates 99% of the utterances. The patient poses only 9% of the questions asked. The physician asks further questions before the patient has had a chance to answer. Most interruptions are by the physician, except when the physician is female. The physician determines topics of discussion. The physician determines when the interaction ends. Well, the problem is that often leaves the patient at the end of this session thinking, oh, what happened there? I wanted to ask this. I didn't, I didn't get around to asking it. And I always say to people, if they're going to the doctor, write down your questions. Because what I've described here, what this research shows, is very typical of many such interactions. That, that people come away feeling they didn't really have a chance to understand or to ask questions. So, um, and this is, this is bad for medicine because we know from other research that people are more likely to follow a physician's instructions if the instructions are clear, if the physician shows some interest in the patient, and if follow-up appointments have been made and so forth. Did you know that um, uh, a paper written by a professor of ophthalmology two or three years ago was titled uh, The Leading Cause of Blindness in North America is Noncompliance. Well, what he meant was that of all the people diagnosed with glaucoma who could keep their sight for the rest of their lives if they put their drops in every day, about a third of them stopped doing so after about a year. Stopped taking them. And their vision goes. Well, if we want people to comply, you need a good relationship with your, with your practitioner. <coughs> what typically happens is a person sees an ophthalmologist, gets the drops, you're told, take these and come back and see me in a year. And that doesn't produce the best kind of medical outcome. So uh, the alternative practitioner, although <laughs> the treatment may not work, the, the bedside manner certainly is, is usually uh, usually there, and much more typical of what we used to see 50 years ago. I like this cartoon, flying doctor, keep taking the pills. He never did have much of a bedside manner. <laughs> okay, another point. There's a fear amongst some people that the cure may be worse than the disease. People are worried about taking pills year after year after year. Again, as a psychologist, I tell, you know, I, I think it's, it's, the cases are rare where a person should have to take medication for anxiety or depression for a long, long time. And yet I see so many people with anxiety and depression who have been told they'll have to take the medication the rest of their lives. Why? There's no, there's no, no good reason for it. If you don't learn how to deal with your anxiety and depression, yeah, it's the only thing you've got going for you. But medication by itself isn't, isn't the answer, it just curbs your symptoms. I'm talking about psychological sphere here, but many people, and I'm sure you know people like this, are, are worried because they're on some kind of medication, they read about, and of course we see all these things in the paper, look at all the drugs in the last year that have been withdrawn because of their dangers. So, given that medicine has become so pharmaceutically based in, in many areas, uh, lots of people are worried about, in fact, I get this comment as a psychologist sometimes, what's the difference between psychologists and psychiatrists? And they'll say, you don't give drugs. I'll say, I'll say right, okay, then I'll, I'll see you. People don't want drugs sometimes. That doesn't mean they're making the right decision always, but it shows again that, that fear. Uh, if you look at homeopathy in some of their advertisements, this point here is, homeopathy has no side effects. <laughs> well, that's good. It's not going to hurt you. But also safe. <laughs> well, another problem that uh, I think leads some people to turn to alternative medicine is the confusion, the information overload. We're surrounded by information, television, magazines, the internet, everywhere. And this has led to what this man I mentioned earlier, James Lefendel, has, <laughs> has uh, described as the worried well phenomenon. We have lots of healthy people who are so bombarded with information that they're worried they may not be healthy. Oh, my shoulder hurts. Gosh, could that be multiple sclerosis, cancer, tuberculosis? Mm -hmm. I hope there's nothing wrong. And of course, if you start to worry, then you start down a path which will uh, ultimately take you to your doctor's office. Your doctor will uh, either tell you nothing's wrong, which may not satisfy you, or give you medication, or send you to a specialist. So we 
we have all this worry. Lots of people go to the doctors when they don't need to. Of course, physicians get tired of this. They become frustrated, and they seem disinterested, which then leads the patient feeling misunderstood, uncared for. Once again, the alternative practitioner doesn't react in that way. Okay, um, a very important point is that alternative therapies may seem to work. And there are a whole number of reasons why they may seem to work. <laughs> I saw a man in my clinical practice just this week who uh, has all sorts of problems following a car accident. And he said, you know, I found one therapy that really is helping more than anything else. And he said, what's that? She's magnetic therapy. <laughs> well, if he were here, he'd say, laugh if you want, but you're not in my shoes. Now, why is it that it works for him, or so he thinks? This is the problem, and, and I, I really want to remind all of you, because I keep reminding myself of this, our brains are all built the same way. We're all easily misled at times. We jump to conclusions at times that we shouldn't jump to. And what happens if you have a lot of pain and suddenly someone does something, it doesn't matter what it is, your pain seems gone, you're going to welcome it. And our brains are set up to associate things that happen together in time as, as having some causal relationship. So this person puts his magnet on, a day or so later his pain's better. My aunt had, had crippling arthritis and actually died at a young age. She became bedridden. <coughs> but she had a magnetic braces. This is going back years ago before it was even popular. And I said, so Andy, why do you wear that? She said, well, it just, the medication, all this strong medicine helps a bit, but this magnet stuff really is the best for me. I said, well, why don't you wear it all the time? She said, oh, well, you can get an overdose. <laughs> <laughs> right? So you only put it on when it's really bad. And then it goes away, or it gets better, and then you take it off, and then when it gets bad again, you put it on. I'm going to come back to that point. But for her, it really worked. And, and uh, so... Uh, let me follow this through in, in the order I have them here. I'll be repeating myself. One of the difficulties in, in terms of trying to uh, disabuse people of their notions about alternative medicine is that lots of times people are going to physicians with problems that physicians can't do much about. Aches and pains, uh, tension, headaches, that sort of thing. Sometimes the person just needs to relax. They need attention. They need <laughs> tender, loving care. Uh, some of the things that they, that, that, and, and of course, if they go to an alternative practitioner, they get that. Some of the things that take people to a physician are hypochondriacal, just excessive worry about being sick, or hysterical. Psychological factors being expressed through, through physical disorders. So there's no real physical disease, but the appearance appears to, to tell the patient that he or she is suffering from some physical ailment. <laughs> so, there are also lots of self-limiting disorders, things that just go away on their own. You know that old saying, well, I think it's here, if you, if you treat a cold, it will be cured in seven days, if you don't treat it, it will take a week. <laughs> now, I mentioned vitamin C in the common cold. This is an interesting one. There's been lots of research, including right here at the University of Toronto, that shows that vitamin C doesn't do anything. It just doesn't. I know some people, I know some scientists, who say, I don't believe that. Because whenever I have a cold coming on, I take vitamin C, and I say, what happens? Well, it doesn't come on. Never? Well, if it does come on, it's not as bad as it would have been. <laughs> and these aren't dumb people. And it's very hard to reason with them, because, you know, we all have these pockets of irrationality. And you might be very smart when it comes to some things, but you may go a bundle on some stupid stock that you had no information about, but your neighbor said, buy this. Or you might have gotten involved in a love of a relationship that everyone else could tell you at the beginning was, was really unreasonable to enter into. So we can, all, we can all be irrational in various parts of our lives. And scientists, too, can be very irrational. And so it's not surprising to see a scientist at times who believes that he or she is controlling the common cold with vitamin C. After all, Linus Pauling wrote books about it. Of course, it wasn't Linus Pauling's area of scientific 
expertise. But he did two Nobel Prizes. Lots of disorders are cyclical. My aunt's arthritis was cyclical. You just track the, the stress she was in. It varied. It would get worse, it would get better. It would get worse, it would get better. So if she put the magnet on when it was worse, well, it's going to get better. And if she takes it off at that point, well, it's going to get worse. And so she's reinforced in her belief that the magnet is having a real effect on the arthritic pain. And so it is with a lot of other disorders. So, um, I said all that, said all that. This is the whole notion of illusory correlation. We see two things that seem to go together. We believe that one is caused by the other, correlated with the other, when in fact they're, they're happening independently. That's the basis of what's called magical thinking. Another uh, point is that sometimes with any disease process, there's what's called a spontaneous remission. And it's not that there's some magic or, or, or uh, supernaturalism involved, but even some cancers go away on their own. And we don't know why right now. One day we will, I'm sure. But when that happens, if someone has a spontaneous recovery and they've happened to pray to get well, they've happened to go to homeopath, they've happened to do any number of things, it happened to use the traditional medical system. Who is going to get the credit? It's whatever or whoever was involved prior to them getting well. And, you know, in, in, again, looking at, uh, particularly in the psychological sphere, studying mental illness, uh, spontaneous remissions are a real problem in terms of evaluating whether treatments work. Because with depression, for example, a uh, certain percentage of people with depression will get well if you do nothing. I'm talking about serious depression. You do nothing at all. They'll get, well, without any treatment. So whatever you do as a therapist, you may think it's you that did it, but it may be that there's just a spontaneous recovery. It has nothing to do with you. You've all heard of the placebo effect. This should probably better be called the placebo response, because it's not so much that the placebo is doing something to you, it's that your belief that you've had some um, treatment that's going to work has led you to react in a particular way. And so uh, this can even have physiological effects in that we know that our thinking affects our physiology. Right? I mean, I could easily get you, I could get your heart rates up right now, or perhaps I could even bring tears to your eyes by the words I use. When I was a young professor, <laughs> I once said in a class, said, I can get anybody depressed in five minutes. And so some smart aleck said, yeah, yeah, show us. And so I did, a bunch of 18, 19-year-old students. And I said, why don't you close your eyes? I'm dying. Two weeks later, I thought, oh, you're death. <laughs> so I'm affected there. We're, we're, we're a physiological reaction. But the, the, meaning we attribute, the meaning we attribute to the medication, or what you will, some of the official, some of the avoiding pain. But the force in their own and had to surgery on the floor. Anybody treating them once, they probably would have been better off had to do things for themselves. Becoming passive, other people have... Just a minute.